Hello there. Hello, 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 hello. Hello, 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 hello. It is the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is episode number 779. 779 of the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. And I hope you're doing well wherever this live stream may find you. I hope you're doing well wherever this podcast may find you. I hope you're doing swimmingly. How am I? All good, all things considered, I cannot complain. All good, all things considered, I truly, truly cannot complain. So, today was the last game of the season before United faced Man City in the FA Cup as the actual last game of the season. Well, last game of the English Premier League and obviously the last game of the season officially overall is going to be our game against Man City which should be a good one to be fair even though we're depleted got a few injuries even though we're not playing well I think as a spectacle it, pretty, it should be a good game our players are jammy motherfuckers they don't really turn it on for the rest of the the rest of the season or the majority of the season but they always seem to turn it on whenever we face our biggest rivals whenever we got the flipping you know um, what do you call it social media galactico no social media um, whatever um I forgot what the name of it, but they call it something anyway online. Where when we face Arsenal, so whenever we face our bitter rivals, our local rivals, our league rivals, our players seem to always, 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 always um, turn it on. So I have no doubt. There's no doubt in me that most likely we will play pretty well against Man City in the final of the FA Cup in a week's time. I've got no doubt about that. But that aside, we did have the last game of the season, and today's last game of the season was against Brighton. And we somehow managed to win 2-0 against Brighton, although we played pretty poorly for the majority of the game. I think Brighton were the better team, um, just in terms of how they played. Um, they were able to pick us apart at will. But I think as per their entire season, defensively, they're not really where they should be, which is probably one of the reasons why if I was going to be a Deserby fan, boy, I'm not really. Um, I'm not really involved. and I don't really care about all the managerial conversations. I'm not going to lie. I'm one of those United fans that's, that thinks our main issue is the Glazers. I'm not one of those United fans that thinks that we're going to suddenly become the best team in the world if we hire Pep Guardiola. Like, I honestly do think now, if we were to hire Pep Guardiola and have Max Allegri as his assistant, we still wouldn't win anything. Um, I don't think people realise how deep-rooted our problems are, especially from the Glazers, because they've instilled or they've kind of laid the groundwork you know with this kind of culture at united where essentially nothing really gets done there's not really a there's not really um a need a drive for us to be the best sporting team in the world we're obviously have a need and a drive for us to be a commercial success as you can see with the shirt sales and all this malarkey what's going on business partnerships collaborations advertisements whatever but when it comes to sporting success and winning trophies the club's not set up that way so because of that loads of things occur whereas you're signing marquee players you're holding on to players and you're you know giving them new contracts just to increase their value you're not really buying players with a plan to win things you're buying players more with a plan to sell shirts all this stuff is happening so for me personally i feel like managers don't really solve an issue don't really solve anything but if i was going to be on the whole manager thing i would be a little bit concerned about the Zerbi because brighton although they play good football they do seem susceptible to lapses of concentration defensively the Zerbi kind of reminds me a little bit this is going to be a little bit sacrilegious to say but he does remind me of a more polished version of a more attack of a more aesthetically pleasing version of a pochettino Pochettino could have his teams playing good football, but defensively, can you count on them to hold on to a lead? Can you count on them to, you know, have a clean sheet? Can you count them just to be defensively solid? Not really, but they're going to play good, fast attacking football, which is okay. But I think with United, we probably need a bit of a balance. But obviously, if you want to start from ground zero, because I think, you know, there's going to be, there's probably going to need to be, there probably might need to be like two or three managers after Eric Ten Hag before we probably start winning trophies again. There's going to need to be managers who kind of lay the groundwork for the guy that's going to come further down the line who's going to get us to win trophies. I don't think any of these guys coming up now will be the ones to lead us to glory because there's so much work that needs to be done. So that aside, um, I still think Deserby does a good job of getting his team to play the way they want to play. I think the main point why people kind of bring up the Zerbi, they bring up the manager at Crystal Palace in comparison to Eric Ten Hag is that Eric Ten Hag always talks about injuries and not having certain players which I understand and I get his, and I sympathize with that completely 
the issue I think we have, myself and other United fans, is that even when we don't have our players that we need, like the starting eleven that we would all favour, or his strongest eleven, or the players that he wants to play the football that he wants, it's still a bit odd because why aren't then why aren't the players who are like second fiddle, why can't they play this certain brand of football that he wants us to play anyway? Why is it only the first team? the people that he actually wants to pick are the only ones that can achieve the football that he wants. Why is that the case? It doesn't really make any sense to me. So whenever people make comparisons with Ayrton Hag and the Zerbi and all these other coaches, because they've been at their clubs for a lot shorter time than Ayrton Hag or the same amount of time, and they've got their teams playing a certain way, regardless of who plays. If they play the kids, if they're playing all the first teamers, they all play a certain way. And you could see, a, you know, you could see basically the style of play being kind of filtered down to every single kind of you know lineup that they kind of play every player knows what their role are blah de, blah 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 we don't seem to have that at the moment and for me that's a problem because ultimately what that means is that you're not l- likely to win games based on how your tactics and formation and shit you're only hoping to win games via individual brilliance which is okay if we're man city but we're not we don't have the we don't have endless funds. We have a lot of funds, but not endless funds. So then you have to go out and sign these players who can give you individual moments of brilliance. Now nowadays I feel like it's getting harder and harder to do that. I think nowadays because we've been we've probably been we've probably been terrible long no, we probably we're probably going to be approaching soon being terrible just as much as time as we've been good. So a lot of players coming up now have probably never seen us be dominant or see us be amazing. So it's hard to get these players to convince us to come to United, especially considering how we give players, you know, we kind of put them through the ringer, playing for United. United comes with a lot of pressure, comes with a lot of scrutiny. It's probably not worth it for a lot of players who actually want to make a name for themselves and kind of go on to do greater things. So you're left with this, you're in this weird place now with United where we maybe aren't good enough to buy the Mbappes of this world. But we're obviously getting bumped when we try and buy, when we buy, obviously, the Antonys for 100 mil nearly. So we're in this weird position where we have a manager that can't get a style of play, you know, implemented unless he has a certain brand of, certain level of players. We can't sign a certain level of players because our, you know, the structure above is terrible. We have no idea what Ineos is going to do. And we have players on our books that we can't seem to get rid of. Weird situation to be in. So anyway, all that aside... I thought the formation today was pretty interesting. Or the formation against Brighton today was pretty interesting. We had essentially no strikers playing up front. And we played this really strange 2 2 2 2 4 formation where we had Bruno Fernandes and Scott McTominay playing basically in the false nine positions. And then Garnacho and, De- and Diallo playing as wingers. And then Amrabat and Mayno playing in the midfield. Personally, I didn't like it. Um, I thought Fernandez was doing his own thing, but Tomane was doing his own thing. There wasn't any connection or teamwork or like duo or partnership between the both of them. McTominay is big for nothing for the most part. Unfortunately, he's one of the players similar to like Pogba. I think he suffers from the, just because he's big, people assume he's a defensive midfielder or that he's physical. He's not really physical. He doesn't really use his size to his advantage. He is probably a little bit more of a fox in a box, a little bit more of a late runner in the era. He doesn't even do that thing. I think even Lampard was better at doing it. Lampard was better at physically imposing himself in the area when he's running onto shots. So he's not like that. So he doesn't really do what you need to do if you want to put him up front as a false nine. That didn't work out. Um, Garnaccio and Diallo were fairly decent. Um, Garnaccio, I'm starting to have a little bit of an issue with when it comes to running down the wing I feel like when Garnacho runs down the wing most of his most of his time is spent thinking about how he's going to get a shot on goal and I feel like the manager lets him do what he wants I don't think the manager cares that he does that which is weird because surely you increase your chances of scoring if you cross the ball into the box but he doesn't he tries to go for shots at weird angles and most of the time, tight angles, the keeper's going to save them, especially if they're in the near post. So then you won't get a chance at kind of having a ricochet into the box or whatever, or corner. So it's a strange thing. So I'm getting a bit tired of Garnacho doing that. Although he is pretty, you know, he's on it. He's always running at defenders and stuff. So that's good to see. The Ahmad Diallo situation, I don't still can't get my head around it. We've only seen him play starting a couple of times this season for United, especially towards the end of the season, just because we're so down in the dumps. So he had to play him. But we've all known he's been a 
an amazing player anyway. There's people online calling him the African, the African Messi for goodness sake. But he's clearly good enough to start the Face United team, but he hasn't. So the fact that that's happened still needs to be questioned. But he played okay, I think. Amrabat was fairly shaky. He got caught on the ball way too many times for me. But again, I don't think he got caught on the ball any more times than what Scott McTominay does playing in the same position. But I still would sign him, you know. I know Amrabat was a loan signing, but I still would sign Amrabat. I swear to God, I would sign him just to have as a squad option because I don't think we're in a position to let go of midfielders. I don't really understand this. Like, we did the same thing with, what's his called? With um, the guy from fucking Dortmund. We did the same thing with that, with the guy we had on loan. And I don't understand why we let go of players in midfield when we need the bodies. We don't have the quality. And Mayno, I personally think, shouldn't have played it. He probably should have played where Bruno Fernandes was. Um, they should probably sort of position. I also don't like Bruno Mayno being told to play this deep landing position. I think he's more of an eight or a 10 than he is of a six or four. But, you know, the club are going to do what the club are going to do. It was good to see um, Martinez back. I thought Casemiro played a lot better uh, at centre back. Um, clearly, he's improving. Our playing day has gotten a bit used to it. But again, it was the last game of the season. Brighton weren't really doing much apart from keeping the ball. Really, they didn't really test us. Really, there wasn't really much pressure, much uh, you know, urgency with the game. So I think people need to relax by saying Casemiro was world class and shit. It was okay. Wan Bissaka is Wan Bissaka. Can't wait for him to leave. And Dalo obviously scored the goal and looked fairly decent. Um, so yeah, all in all, decent performance. We got the two. We got the we got the victory at needed end of the end of the game. Um, Dallo's finish was very very well taken, very clinical in the box. Rasmus Hoyland's build up play was probably the most impressive thing about the goal. Um, I think um, we all know he can finish, but sometimes his build up play, hold up play, or whatever before the goal goes in the before the ball goes in the net is a bit skept is a bit you know on the shaky side. But I think he showed why a lot of people like myself are big fans of him. Because of his ability to kind of drop a shoulder, run into the box, finish with either foot. Like, that was a really tidy finish. Very, 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 very tidy finish into the bottom corner. So, very happy for Rasmus Hoyland to get that second goal and seal the victory. But, of course, the game was pretty shit, like I said. Pretty boring. Um, we probably didn't deserve to win. But, again, as per usual with United, we have the better players. So, we're always going to punish teams if they don't take their chances. Because we have the better players. But it's not necessarily a good indictment on the quality of the game. Okay, that to be said, I was actually happy how it ended though. Because the way it ended, as followed because of the MUFC MPB account, May United finished 8th in the Premier League. No European football next season unless United beat City in the FA Cup Finals to secure Europa League. 8th place is May United's worst finish in Premier League history. I'm happy this happened. Why am I happy this happened? Because I feel like sometimes European football, especially amongst our fan base, is almost like a way for us to excuse or to cope with how bad a season's gone. Oh, at least you've got European football. At least you've got European football. Whereas I feel like European football should be given to the... Deser it's like a deserving slot. It's like an illustration or an example of how far you're progressing or how, how much you're progressing in a season that you're able to kind of, you know, secure a European place, even though you don't win a trophy. It shows that you're kind of competing with the top teams up there. But the fact that we finish in eighth outside of all the auto outside of the automatic places and now we have to rely on winning a trophy against man city to play european football i think is perfect and it doesn't give anybody any false hope because i feel like some fans would have seen this 2-0 away from brighton away to brighton result especially considering how they played against us in the first game of the season they would have seen that result and thought oh we're doing well give Ayrton hog more time give him more money blah 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 na 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 no no, 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 no. No more money, no more time. Eighth is where we're at. This is not good enough. He needs to go, as do all the players that have been kind of responsible for this league finish. It's a reminder that league positions, for the most part, are a very accurate representation of where you are as a club. And if we're eighth, we deserve to be eighth. If anything, if anything, if you ever watched us play football, you would know that United probably deserve to be far lower. If anything, United deserve to be far lower in the Premier League considering how poor we've been the entire time this season. But we've gotten lucky with individual moments of brilliance. We've gotten lucky with just being lucky in matches. We've won matches that we probably don't deserve to win. We've just been able to jam it up. We should be far lower than eighth, really. If anything, I think if the final actual table, the final league table is, at, is kind of embarrassing because it kind of proves that the English Premier League isn't as competitive as people like to make it seem and the quality isn't as great as people like to make it seem. So let me actually see, I think the table is somewhere here and the point tally is kind of wild, I'm not going to lie, because we're shit. 
we're shit, right? And we and we finish sixty. We finished with sixty points this season at eighth. But look at the team that finished fourth. They're only eight points above us. Aston Villa finished in fourth place, or let's say even Tottenham, right? That's an automatic European place. They're only four points ahead of us. Can you or six points? So can you imagine how embarrassing that is, considering how terrible United have been? That we're only six to eight points away from being in the top five and finishing, you know, European places automatically. It's quite embarrassing. So the top two teams, City and Arsenal, obviously pulling away from everybody, but the rest of us are just fighting for scraps, really, for the most part. But again, I'm happy we finished the season in eighth. That's where we deserve to finish. Hopefully, this season, this summer. We see some big changes, mostly in outgoings. My main kind of barometer of where we are as a club and where we're trying to go and to kind of have an idea on whether or not I'm going to, you know, be um, confident with the whole Ineos are in charge of the sport inside of our club is if the outgoings are very ambitious because the outgoings need to be important. Already they've confirmed that Varane and Martial are leaving. Martial end of his contract. Varane obviously getting a bit older and obviously injury prone. That makes sense. And that's a, those are easy decisions to make. But the hard decisions to make, what do you do with Marcus Rashford? What do you do with Bruno Fernandes? What do you do with Harry Maguire? What do you do with Scott McTominay? Luke Shaw? All these people are much harder to make a decision on. But if you're actually a top club, you, you get those guys out because we need a refresh. We need to start again. Um, Arnie Sloth that's going to fucking um, Liverpool. Like he's walking into a Liverpool team that's not going to have Salah there. If, Liverpool, if Salah was still playing for us, we'd be holding on to him until he turns fucking 42. But he's going to leave um, Liverpool at the end of this season. Um, Thiago Alcantara, all these other players. So he's going to come in with a clean slate and able to kind of dictate what goes on forward. And be able, and you also be able to judge Arnie Slough better because we have his own players. So I think Ayrton Hag, if he does stay another season, I don't want him to, but if he does stay that last season, they'll need to get rid of a lot of players. And maybe some of the players that he signed, maybe even the Antis might need to get rid of as well because we can't be going into the next season relying on the Aaron Rambasakas, the Harry Maguires, the McTominays, even just the Brunos in terms of him playing every single minute, every single game when fit. I don't like that anymore. So hopefully we see a change with those things going forward. Hopefully we do see a change with those things going forward. We can only hope. We can only hope. I also saw this story, courtesy of the Shade Borough, regarding the one and only Sloan, who was able to secure a pretty lucrative and pretty impressive collaboration um, with the FA. And he designed the FA trophy that's going to be presented to the clubs when um, United um, face Man City in the FA Cup final in a week's time. So it's a pretty amazing honour to be able to design a trophy. I'm not too sure if this is the first time it's done. Again, I don't really pay attention to trophy design and shit, um, even though obviously I watch football. Maybe this is not the first time, but this is a pretty cool thing that they've done here. So go to the Shade Borough. They say um, British Nigerian artist Oliver Sloan has teamed up with renowned goldsmith to without goldsmith thomas light to design a bespoke one-off replica of the emirates okay so i guess it's not really an official fa cup maybe it's like a it's like a special edition one maybe that's the one's going to be put in a, i don't know how it's going to work so either way it's still cool um one-off replica of the emirates cup sloan's took to instagram to thanks the emirates and calling the tribute the biggest thing he's done to date so it is quite cool it also comes with the back of that rolex collaboration that he did and there's another collaboration i think he done with mercedes or something like that so it's a pretty cool design if you're not familiar um if you can't see the pictures essentially it's a it's a trophy and you got to design the outside of it you see some original sketches here at the bottom and you see he's kind of you know he's a traditional or I guess he's kind of what you call it his identity is kind of you know what he does with his illustrations with those big teeth and the eyes and shit and obviously some pictures here with him posing with the trophy itself so it does look kind of sick right really cool little thing that he's done in design there now the funny thing is what I was thinking about this whole situation was that I wonder what that girl thinks that art babe Remember that girl that was beefing with Sloan online and getting getting annoyed and kind of getting jealous that she's not been given the same opportunities that he has, even though, according to her, he draws images that are racially, um, you know, insulting to black people in terms of depictions you know, that he has on his paintings with these kind of gollywog type figures. And they were having this back and forth online where they were kind of beefing. And then Sloan tried to kind of big time her by trying to buy her artwork, like basically saying, hey, if you need the money, I'll buy some of your pieces. She then refunded his order. She didn't even ship them shit. Fuck you. I'm not fucking I'm selling my work to a racist, um, which is funny to say to somebody that's black, whatever. Um, he then, of course, you know, back and forth, whatever. So I understand both sides of the argument 
argument. I understand it from her point of view, just, you know, being somebody that, you know, with her paintings, I, think, I forgot her name again, but she does these really kind of almost photorealistic, I guess, more so, um, very loving tributes of black women. And then he does obviously the complete opposite, um, where he's doing these really kind of crass, almost ugly caricatures of black people or himself in the port, because I think most of them are hip depictions of himself. But again, who cares about getting into the details? What I wanted to mention about this was that this is just one of those rules. I, I'm sure there's a theory around it. There's a principle around it about the people at the top getting all the things. And I think it's just one of those things you have to kind of be okay with when you work in the arts. There's always going to be one or two people. There's going to be a photographer. There's going to be a stylist. There's going to be a DJ. There's going to be a fucking, you know, an artist, a contemporary artist who's going to get all the opportunities all of the time. But it doesn't diminish from what you're going to get. But in the interim, in the moment, they're going to get everything. They're going to get all the big brand collaborations. They're going to get Dell, Apple, all this sort of malarkey. But you're still going to get some stuff yourself. You're just going to have to fight for whatever scraps that you can get a hold of. But them getting all the things doesn't mean that they're the best. It just means they're the kind of touch point ones. They're the, uh, they're the kind of main person at the time. Because I think it happens in every generation. There's always one or two people who are like the main person that gets everything and everyone else gets the rest. Um, but it just continues. It's just one of those type of things. Like, you know, this guy's just going to keep winning because he's the most visible. He's the most um, well-known. He's got the most clout. He's the most... Like, I mean, it just is what it is. So getting jealous at someone like this and how they're winning is really dumb and very counterintuitive because he's going to keep on winning. It's going to keep giving you a heart attack every time you see him winning. So you have to kind of be okay with it you have to make peace with it and know that just because he wins doesn't mean that you can't win. And also his winning doesn't really say much about what you do. It's just one of those things, you know, he's kind of on top. He's killing at the moment. He's he's having his moment in the sun. It might be a long moment in the sun, it might be a short, whatever it is, he's the main person. Just do your own thing and kind of keep plugging away. And then hopefully you can kind of fight for the scraps and the scraps aren't shit, right? Imagine if he does Apple, you do Dell. If he does Asus, you do the... You do Lenovo. Those aren't shit things, but I think sometimes in life or in general, you know, comparison is always the thief of joy. And you end up thinking, oh, because you didn't do the FA Cup, that obviously you are not where you need to be, which is obviously not true either. Because I'm sure this also involves all types of headaches, right? In terms of doing these sort of things, you will have to kind of, you know, go back and forth, do notes, go back over edits, blah, 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 budgets, all this stuff, deadlines. It's not as easy as it looks, but I guess over time you learn how to work with it. But even, overall, I think it's pretty cool to see um, this being done. Again, I'm not sure if this is the first time, but I like the idea of um, the FA, you know, hiring artists to kind of do their own representation or edits or whatever um of the trophy especially epic cup trophy with it being such a fucking legendary trophy without being such a legendary competition especially in the uk i think it's absolutely amazing and i can't wait to see more of it going forward so big up sloan great to see hopefully we see more going down the line and i hope that art baby girl doesn't see this as like a you know a sad indictment on what she's doing um it doesn't mean because he gets all the things that you can't get some of the things you just have to keep on plugging away and hopefully you your chance will come hopefully your chance will come also continuing on from that continuing on from that so um there was this event that happened over the weekend featuring uh skepta skepta performed at this puma event so there's a Puma event for Skepta Shoes, which I'm sure I kind of um, spoke to you about it before in the pod. Um, these particular trainers that Skepta's been doing with Puma, which I think are fairly, fairly nice. I'm not going to lie. Um, I said before that I would have probably preferred them in a boot. I think as a boot shape, they'd probably be quite good. But I think as a silhouette, regardless, it's pretty, it's a quite an original silhouette in a way that I kind of see a lot of like, you know, notes of the Air Max TL. I think I mentioned it before. Um, it's kind of got a little bit of an Air Max TL vibe about it. Um, but I still like the shape. I like the fact that the branding and the logo of the Puma sign has been kind of um, hidden on the upper or you, you can only see it obviously when you flash the light on the upper and you get this nice iridescent look and also you can kind of see it with the stitching but when you see it with the regular color where you can't really see the line of it so i like how they hit how it's not really about the logo because most shoes are like that i think that's what yeezy did in terms of changing the design language of sneakers they changed them by 
not having the logo be a major part of the actual design it's all hidden like even the wave runner the 350s all easies really i don't think have any overt branding some of them do have these little free free um kind of lines on the inside but usually it's not really kind of all over the top of it like they would do in classic nikes or adidas and shit so i like that skeptics kind of in you know um interpreted or taken some of that and put it in his own shoe um i also like the outsole and i just like it overall as a shape i think it's fairly sturdy also kind of sleek um kind of chunky without being too without being like a you know overtly gargantuan if that makes any sense and like i said before i think this silhouette would look insanely good in a mid or high so he did this shoe he put it out and as per usual when these brands do these type of things they always have like a influencer type of an event especially if they're doing it with a musician they'll have the musician do some sort of like live band thing and i guess uh Skepta did like a live performance somewhere in london i'm not sure where where he performed and he obviously wore i think some puma apparel or that might be um included in the actual um collaboration as well and he obviously performed some bits and pieces when he was on stage and people are not happy with the crowd because the crowd are very dead um they're not really hyped as you would imagine a skeptic crowd would be but i think this makes complete sense when you think about the event itself it was mostly for industry influencer type people and not regular customers or regular fans like you and i so it makes sense why they were a bit stiff but watch the video anyway and you'll hear or see exactly what people are meaning when they mean about the fans being a little bit dead yeah well i finished my album now i owe you one that's a third of my advertising done i had a couple man this my mom god forgive me if i bust my God forgive me if I bust my nine. God forgive me if I bust my nine. I don't wanna get locked up like shine. This Jay and me then cross my line. God forgive me if I bust my nine. God forgive me if I bust my nine. I don't wanna get locked up like shine. If it is my mum then yeah, yeah. Six to drop in the morning. I flew out, flew down the road, flew back, then flew in. My mum knows what I'm doing. And deep down I know she's screwing. I fell asleep with 13 scores in my mouth. Had a dream about As you can see from the from the video. The fans aren't really moving that much. There's not really much kind of, you know, going on there. They're all kind of standing still with their phones in their hand, wanting to capture the moment as opposed to kind of enjoying and experiencing it in real time. So people were really kind of pissed with that sort of thing. But to me, this makes complete sense because every sort of like influence or type of event I've been to has been like this, especially when the musicians playing. Everyone's more worried about their call, which makes fun, which makes sense as well because they're fucking influencers, they're cool kids, as opposed to actually having fun and going crazy. Bad chicken and chips like an idiot, I started chewing Woke up then I started spewing Thinking when is all this gonna end Had to open them up and wrap them again I've been on the road so if the beat these road bars It's nothing I'll slap them again The real man them know I'm certified They can't score me, I've been there Yeah, but what you talk about? Next one maximum Yeah, my name's Joseph But I'm your average Joe though I'm at your whole team on a solo I'm a magician, you're a magician again I'm like pizza high, you're like pizza me wife, I hold this a no-no Never give no go, my last roll No skepta, I still getting forced from my girl Going up and down on the X Yo, I'm like bit MCs, wanna diss my tune Same way, man, wanna spit on my tune Boy, fan bars, come on, hey, Max, man, pull up that bum, bum, bum. Come on, man, come on If this was any other time, that stage would have been shaking People would have been fainting in the crowd. They would have been jumping up and down. They would have been boop, 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 your oi, oi, oi. There would have been so much noise, so much pandemonium going on. It just as any other crowd apart from an influencer crowd. And again, I'm not too shocked. I, I just would have wished when these type of events happen, I know, you know, most of the time they're kind of limited in capacity. You don't want to draw too much attention to it. You kind of want to do it in a unique space. So you kind of have to do like an unofficial, official type of event thing. You also want to make it seem exclusive to give it a bit of a cachet. But I think when you're doing an event with an artist, especially a musician, you maybe owe it to them to also have a portion of their fans there. So maybe when they these brands do these type of influencer events, it might be beneficial for them to kind of just let the artists give away some tickets to their actual fans so that they could kind of, you know, fill out the space and obviously make the atmosphere a little bit more electric as opposed to just all the cool kids because again i don't want to blame the fashion kids the cool kids in the scene who just want to stand there and look good because yeah why do you want to fuck up your baggy trousers and your timberlands to jump up and down the skepto you know i mean you kind of got invited there to kind of quote unquote cover it and put on your instagram and whatever it may be on your online magazine so i get why you're being cool but to make the videos pop a bit more having people go crazy in the crowd also helps having fucking mosh pits actually helps having people pulling and throwing each other around actually fucking helps having people singing along to the bars actually helps so maybe it's advantageous to give those artists a small portion of tickets to give to their fans 
so that you can kind of recreate and kind of give that place that little punch and vibe that it needs because this crowd was so so dead it was quite depressing because it made you think it made you kind of doubt skepta's power it made you think hold on is skepta actually as good as i think he is or did i guess it it's like no he is actually as good as you think you are we saw him tear it up at coachella we've seen him tear it up here um you know many and many a time and one good example was this legendary set back in the day this is in shoreditch underneath that bridge if you know you know um i i, I don't think i was actually there that time i might i think i i think i went i think obviously i've been raving around that area for a while and i think it was near that place called peanut the peanut factory that was in short it's true that i think that was also the place where they used to do some of the first boiler rooms and stuff back in the day but if you know you know anyway but this is a legendary sort of like reaction from kind of skeptical performing in places to kind of show you what the man's power is like when he's actually around his actual fans in real life and not cool kid influencers look at the power of this <laughs> obviously that's a completely different response to the video i showed you previously so it's kind of you know sad to see him have to go through that sort of stuff but i guess as an artist it's something that you kind of have to you know kind of stomach because you know it's always the ups and downs of what you do with your career it kind of basically is what it kind of basically is now the funny thing is off the back of that there was some interesting obs um interesting um information has been put out there courtesy of skeptic himself on his on his twitter regarding his puma collaboration so he posts a few bits on bobs on there on his twitter page you have the main picture here from the profile um piece that he's got on hypebeast kind of covering his collaborations and his work with puma so far um you've also got him retweeting and responding to comments of people saying i hope he never retires um another one saying where he said he sold out in japan another one where somebody's saying hey you save puma on god he said i'm i'm in silhouette mode i'm just getting started so clearly you see he's happy about the whole collaboration with puma and then suddenly things kind of change suddenly things kind of change regarding the puma collaboration i'm not really sure what's going on what's happened but something changed in the midst of those tweets so his recent tweet here says made bangers at that made bangers at that last place and they still treated me like an influencer because i haven't been in school for shoe design but the game is a game i could never complain so this is a really crazy situation because i remember i said in that original podcast i was really curious why didn't nike ever sign skepta permanently as an actual brand ambassador collaborator whatever whatever the term was because the shoes that he did with nike were fucking hard right from first of all you've got the nike air max so you got the skepta nike air max right here the nike air max 97s which i think was still one of the best collaborations ever in terms of a nike air max 97 then you've got the skepta shocks which i think really don't get the the love they kind of deserve especially for making that shock design popular and kind because of, i also remember them being on the feet of everybody for a while so i wonder after these two bangers of shoes why didn't nike decide to kind of sign him on permanently because they need it especially with virgil gone especially with some of the waning collaborations that they have going on at the moment they need probably a lot more people to kind of flesh out their kind of collaboration you know outlet and what they put out there and especially you know with Skepta being a UK fucking legend obviously having that connection to grime whatever music we play here Europe um the crossover to fucking America and just his history again we just have I think intrinsically personally to my own opinion I think the UK definitely has the best taste in sneakers and he obviously coming from ends he's known you know he knows about all the shoes that we've worn back in the day coming up Hirachis, Air Maxes, Air Force Ones all that malarkey the scope of him designing underneath that banner will there be 
been fucking crazy. But they didn't sign him for some reason. I didn't, never really understood why. But this might be an in, in this might be an insight into why that never happened. Because he's suggesting in this particular tweet that Nike would treat him like an influencer, which seems to be the standard thing. Nike seemed to favor treating their collaborators, with the exception of Virgil, as inf or maybe Virgil was the same. Maybe Virgil did accept the influencer kind of um, label under Nike because he knew it was a far bigger play long term. Because I think that's what people want, and I don't blame Skepta. If you if you if you put up numbers and you you know you drop those ninety sevens, you drop those fucking shocks, and they both sell out plus the track suits, the imagery fucking goes hard. They still got, you know, influence on the streets now. They still go for crazy amounts on resale. It goes to, it goes about saying that it would make sense for you to want more than just a fee. You might want residuals, right? You want a percentage. You might want to see on the board. You might want more freedom. You might want more ownership, whatever. But you don't just want to be paid as an influencer anymore. You want more than that. I understand that. But for some reason, Nike don't like doing that. They don't like to, they kind of like to sign, they, they're in favor of signing athletes as athletes, which makes sense, giving them their shoe or that salaki. But they don't like doing it with influencers. And the funny thing is, I would wager, I'd go as far as saying, most likely, again, I don't know if the numbers are true, but most likely, outside of Jordans, influencer shoes are the ones that make the most for Nike anyway. I'd imagine so. Unless there's some particular Nike shoe that makes crazy amount, but I can't think of a prominent Nike basketball player now that'll be putting up as much numbers as like, I don't know, a fragment shoe would if it does eventually come out. Do you know what I mean? They just sell way better. So if that's the case, why don't you just give them a deal like an athlete deal where they get a chance to kind of, you know, lend, you know, um, lend their input to a design of, of a shoe, maybe, you know, whatever, ongoing collaboration, whatever. I don't understand why they don't do that, but they don't. So obviously he's he was ranting about that a little bit. Then he also explains here, everything happens the way it should. I proved myself in Portland time after time. And now we're in Nuremberg with a much better situation for ourselves as a team. The SK lives on. So I, I think Nuremberg is the headquarters of where Puma is, right? I'm assuming. I think that's what he's talking about there. Um, but again, I just don't understand. Like, I don't understand why he isn't still at Nike and also Sean Wolverspoon. I don't get it because they should be still there putting up numbers and helping that brand stay somewhat relevant because the collaborations are coming out now. There's a fucking shit. Another person said this. Kind of wish Skepta never signed with Puma considering their Israeli ties. Kind of wish he went to independent route. Who knows? Maybe the independent route is coming. He's hoping. Love you, Skepta. Hashtag scope. I don't like this. This I don't like this um temporary activism that fans are basically trying to ask their favorite artist or collaborator to do. Because unfortunately, I think if, if you as a customer, if you as a fan don't want to buy certain things because of their ties politically and what's happening now in the world, especially with the genocide going over in Gaza, I understand it. But putting the artist in that corner is completely unfair when things change. Because when things change, those deals are gone and now they've missed out on a huge chunk of money, which then would have helped them as an artist to create certain pieces. And you also miss out on maybe particular work that would have come out if they had that money in the first place. So I think it's a bit unfair to judge somebody um for working with a company that might have quote unquote israeli ties in the interim especially considering how quickly things can change and you're also kind of you know um stopping them from securing the bag and getting money in their pocket which then will help them create more art for you to enjoy in the first place so i don't really understand that whole premise anyway it's fucking bizarre um, and if we do go down that route and we are kind of politically steadfast and we do kind of quote unquote cancel certain brands because of their ties politically socially whatever it may be or with terms of the war we don't really have anything to support so there has to come a point where you kind of try to do right by your actions and less by the people you collaborate with if that makes sense but i could be wrong here he quoted that tweet and says I ain't gonna lie i really is a lot more than reading the small print before signing contracts got to do due diligence and yes i'm forever a student in practice to eventually take independent route love abdi now ab uh abid love abid the funny thing is about what this person said also which is really i think maybe it's a bit lack of knowledge but it's really difficult to go independent. Like to make your own shoe, from what I understand, when it comes to manufacturing, shoes and footwear is the most expensive. Shoes and footwear. 
that's why most people do collaborations because you can just link up with somebody who's an expert and a master in their field in doing footwear and you can just collaborate on a model so you don't have to build it up from the ground up yourself but obviously you know if you can get to a point where you can do it yourself you try but for the most part footwear is really hard to do at that level high level and usually anyway if you could do go the independent route there's a lot of I've, I've seen it myself with a lot of independent shoe brands they go through a lot of like you know you have to go through you have to kind of struggle to get to the point where your shoe is actually to a level that can compete with the footwear brands out there that are doing the business because you know the quality is the quality isn't the greatest materials the access to certain factories and certain fucking processes is quite limited so the fans that try and push you to go the independent route probably won't be the ones still riding with you if you put out a couple dud shoes that the sole doesn't really look the that legit or it crumples because you have to kind of go through some shit to kind of get to the end anyway so people pushing in the eternal pattern route is kind of again short side considering how hard it is to do in the first place but we move another one says don't let puma see this and skeptic quotes and says they know how i feel i speak my mind they've announced their sponsorship will end this august the clock is ticking <sighs> So for some reason, again, I don't understand these brands. For some reason, Skepta went out there. He he somehow was able to make Puma somewhat re relevant again by making this model, which I think if they put it in different colorways, they have it in the middle or high. Um, they put out the tracksuit. They put out that jacket that he wore in some music video and shit. They actually kind of pushed this hard. I think this will do some numbers and bits. Somehow now Puma are willing to let him walk away. Again, like, so, and, like what the fuck is going on? I wonder if these brands look at collaborations with artists as being interchangeable because there's so many of them maybe. But I think there's no one really of his level to replace him with. That's the issue. You're going to like, who else of his level can you replace him with? That's the problem. But I guess if you're a brand, you probably think to yourself, oh, I could just get somebody else. I could probably get three other influencers to do what he could do by himself. But I think as a customer, as a fan, you kind of want to see how his journey evolves you kind of want to see how he develops his language his design style and his language and the product offering that kind of gets done loaded down the line with puma you don't want to just see like a one hit and bang type of thing you want to see how it goes on down the line and i think as puma as well i think just again as a as a fan of the shit from afar i think it's just quite cool to see all of these brands competing at the highest level with some of the biggest artists out there underneath their belt it'd be quite cool to see you know all these people going head to head bar for bar and trying to put out the best product why wouldn't you want to see that and the fact that puma would you know want to have this or let this guy walk away makes no sense to me but again it's maybe proof that this whole influencer shoe sneaker game thing is a lot trickier than what it seems to be but again i just find it interesting and odd how these brands don't sign these celebrities or these artists as athletes in that on an athlete deal and just see them as people that you can collaborate with one time and send them off on their way especially when the shoes sell out they make a ton of money why won't you just want to do that again and again and again because this is far more interesting to me these pumas that skip to put out are far more interesting than them putting out another fucking puma clyde i don't give a fuck you know what i mean i'd much rather see puma try new things try and put out new silhouettes not do another retro and doing with somebody that has a lot of cachet, that has a lot of clout, has a lot of notoriety, has a lot of influence. That's actually something interesting to see. Um, I don't want to see retros again. I don't know. It's just boring. That's something I've kind of become, I've become a, aware of more ever since the success of Yeezy. Of like seeing shit, bro. When Kanye was at, he was putting numbers on a board while also putting out different silhouettes and styles every single year or whatever it may be. To the point where like he had a, he was basically, you know, he basically rewired people's brains for to what to expect when it came to Adidas and to kind of challenge themselves in terms of what they would wear and what they wouldn't wear, how they'd wear it. Whereas these brands are just bring out the same runners, the same shoes again and again and again in different colorways. It's just like, bro, come on, bro. Let's test ourselves. Let's push the limits. Let's kind of, you know, um, do the unexpected and kind of go from there. But again, who knows? Maybe this is just kind of, um, pre maybe this is just Skepta ranting now while he's kind of frustrated. Maybe Puma will announce that they've signed him on a deal, but I find it interesting or baffling that they'll let the deal go all the way down to August before they kind of make a change. But who knows? Maybe it's a, maybe it's a preemptive thing. Let's hope and wait and see. Hopefully it changes. Hopefully it blood clot changes. Talking about changing, <laughs> I want to know when it comes to academics, 
does he realize just how much damage this one particular tweet from his girlfriend current situation ship whatever the name is with that girl called shay glizzy the Shea Glizzy girl, as you guys will know, um, academics unfortunately has been sued um, for rape and defamation from this one young lady that accused him and his friends of raping her one evening when she came back to his uh, mansion after they went to some party somewhere with Antonio Brown. Now, the funny thing is, if you paid attention to academics, you would have known the story because during the time when academics was going through some passer with his girl, Shay Glizzy, on and off relationship thing, she went to socials and she posted this particular post I've got here on the screen where she said on her screenshot on Instagram stories, or when the house got raided because you caught a rape charge by a girl from Philly after you let the Antonio Brown pool party and me and your mum got put in cuffs and she had to go to the hospital afterwards. You ain't have to front door for three months from them breaking it just to get your nasty ass academics. So this woman putting out this screenshot was a was the one domino effect that led to academics getting on stream and essentially trying to defend himself against these rape allegations because we would have had no idea this happened. Allegedly, the police came in, they stormed his house, they confiscated the footage of his CCTV, blah, 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 blah. blah. Ultimately, it didn't lead to any charges because I guess in academics um, explanation, he says that his two friends were the ones that might have raped the girl, but he didn't do anything with her. And I think he showed her the tape and she was consenting in the tape or something. And I don't know I've seen a screenshot from the actual lawsuit. And I'm not going to lie. The screenshot from the lawsuit looks like she was very aware of her surroundings if that makes any sense i'm not gonna lie again it was just a screen grab from a from a fucking lawsuit yeah, from from a video it's not the whole video but i don't know if you can put again not to be crass but i don't know if you can put someone in that position under duress you know it didn't look like an under duress that like we we know what i guess we can imagine what somebody under duress or under threat of violence would look like once they're getting raped and she didn't look like that in that picture that i saw so maybe she's just lying and it's all one big ruse. But regardless, if it's not one big ruse, could you imagine you losing everything you've worked for? When you're academics, think about maybe these days, people still look at academics like a loser, but I think he's kind of done well to, I wouldn't say repair his reputation, but he's almost done well to kind of, you know, give it another lease of life. But, you know, he wasn't looked at as the best way for a long time. He's done so much work to get where he at, is at the moment streaming day after day hour after hour youtube clips instagram account twitch constantly working plugging away in a very judgmental hyper masculine um whatever judgment judgmental fucking hip-hop industry he finally ascends to the top of the mountain and then he gets even higher right during the fucking kendrick and, and drake beef both of the most prominent or two of the best rappers in the industry name drop him in songs which then boosts his profile even higher it kind of represents a bit of a change to, you know in the industry because i think last time that drake beefed somebody i think that was meek mill um he dropped the song i think he might have dropped it on fucking funk or something right so those are when they supposed so it's always kind of like a change of of changing of the guard of seeing like academics be the one to get sent the dubs and to get sent the war tunes before a funk flex then just as you're tr you're reveling in that kind of glory you're reveling in that adoration bang you get hit with a rape and defamation charge from this young lady and it's all spurned and it's all coming from this one particular tweet that your ex sent out in a moment of anger but this isn't the only thing though she's done plenty of other things she's allegedly you know um hit his mom she's a, she's been on camera throwing eggs at his face she i think at one point she got his internet taken down or something i don't know if you guys remember that period where she did she mashed up the modem or something so he couldn't stream for a while she done that thing where she revealed that he was taking some sort of sti medication because he had bumps on his dick or something like that girl has been nothing but trouble but for some reason academics can't see it which is understandable again because he's a guy and most likely that box is fire right that's that's the kind of that's the kind of conclusion that most dudes have come to most likely that girl is so fired that he just can't let go and i think some guys have been in that position where despite your common sense and your rational brain screaming at you to run the box is so fire you just stay but in this regard like i said he has millions to lose legitimately millions and also his freedom right is on the line it just becomes you know if this is true it's gonna ruin everything
and we've already seen he's very emotionally vulnerable he's prone to crying could you imagine the depressive state it'll put him in if he loses everything rumble deal all this malarkey spotify but spotify's already gone but all these big deals kind of go away record labels stop one are working with you because this one girl did this one with one instagram story in anger and now you're out here on your own basically fighting for your life and already, he already doesn't have a he already doesn't have a good reputation online because people think he bullies women which I think is a bit of a false representation. I think he's a little bit heavy-handed. He seems to enjoy arguing with girls, which I think is very lame as a man to enjoy going back and forth with women online. But I think he does go at everybody equally, to be fair. But obviously, when it's women, it's a bit more high prof. It's a bit more publicized and shit. Well, the funny thing is, in the in the midst of all of this, academics made a very interesting comment that made me think, oh, I think this guy might be guilty of something i don't know what it is but this is a strange comment to make in the midst of you being sued for rape and sued for defamation people thinking you did it uh this is a very way, weird way to defend yourself so academics was on the stream defending himself and look at the comment that he made regarding the whole situation to me it felt very odd in the midst of what's going on but then i also thought about it some more i was thinking to myself if you did actually get accused of rape and you are innocent how do you actually defend yourself without sounding like a monster like how do you accurately defend yourself how do you correctly defend yourself online without sounding like you're almost diminishing the accusation you're not taking it very seriously how do you actually defend yourself properly because this ain't the, i don't think this is the way but it definitely is a way but i wonder if this might explain why he decided to say this but this is a very crazy thing to say in the midst of you getting cancelled for rape and I can't talk about it too much just because I've paid lawyers to handle court. And these people who are coming at me are hoping that I f that up by handling it on social media. The police wants nothing to do with this. They're saying there is no crime. The cops have said, peace. There ain't no crime that we could prove. That's what they've said. We're out of this. Do you know who's the lawyer representing whoever? against me y'all know the lawyer who y'all think that lawyer is is it possible that that person who really seen the money grab was really the diddy stuff and who was the biggest covering the diddy stuff that lawyer allegedly reached out to some people of mine saying if act continues to doubt what we are purporting against diddy Remember, we could file a lawsuit on him too. Let me tell you this. Let me tell you this about everybody in the industry. I'm going to tell y'all all this right now. <laughs> if Ack ever goes down, y'all all go down with me. Cause Did you hear that? One more time. Y'all all this right now. If Ack ever goes down, y'all all go down with me. Imagine being accused of rape, having the girl come on camera and say what she said, having a very spot. And again, you have to remember the recollection or the how he retold the story of what went down was very dodgy in the first place yes the girl was the one that blew up his spot by posting this but she posted on instagram but then i also remember right after that he went on stream and he was visibly hung over with his hair all out and his face all puffy and shit from the booze and he was saying something along he basically tried to make it seem like he was asleep the entire time obviously later on down the line especially in the lawsuit i think it kind of says in the lawsuit in black and white that there was evidence um through a you know rape kit that he did have intercourse with this young lady so but he didn't let that be known when he was speaking on camera about it so now you're like okay if you had it and she's saying it was rape but you're saying it didn't happen you're not even remitted it happened there's something about a bit off there and then it's to defend yourself you get on camera and you say if i go down you all go down with me as if to say Oh, you think I'm bad? Look at what you did. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like a good defense for rape. <laughs> if I didn't do it, I'm not going to say, oh, if I did that, you did more than that. No, 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 no. There is no scale. Oh, because you did seven rapes and I only did one, I'm better than you. No, like it's all bad. <laughs> and if I didn't do it, I'm just going to say vehemently and consistently and very loudly 
that I didn't do it. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say I didn't do it. I'm going to fight to clear my name. And I'm even going to go as far maybe as saying is that I'm going to exhaust every legal avenue. I'm going to use all this money that I've gained from streaming and all this malarkey to make sure that I bring to justice all the people that lied against my name. That's what you're going to do. You should do those type of things to make it clear. Oh, shit. This guy means business, right? Instead of saying, oh, if I go down, you go down with me. Bro. So what? Are you saying that you did it then? Because other people, like, like what, what the fuck is that? What kind of defense is that? It's such a strange way to kind of defend yourself. And I don't really understand why he said what he said. But again, he could be panicking. He could be just waiting, trying to figure it out, make sense of it overall. But this also makes me think that this is to be expected, though, in a way. This makes sense, to be expected. Why do I say this? I think this might be one of the things that explains why these guys are such losers that they get themselves in these type of situations because they get money and it kind of allows them to have access to girls they probably never should have access to it probably speeds up their sexual experience relationship experience more than probably it should have and they get in situations that are completely avoidable because in my head if this is me personally going back to the whole story allegedly the story goes something along the lines of he's already out he goes to antonio brown's he goes to a, an antonio brown pool party with his friends they're having a good time he's getting really fucked up and then this girl contacts him i guess while he's posting pictures probably on instagram because you know how it is you show off online you're posting your stories somebody reaches out to you and then you want to continue the fun then he invites her to meet him at the place she takes a bit long to get there because she lives quite far and then by the time she gets there he's already leaving so he's already super smashed they go back home and he falls asleep. Happens. Happens to me before. I've I, I fell asleep before painting time when I got too much. I'm not really the most, you know, I don't, I'm not the, I'm not the most um, strongest when it comes to drinking. You know, after a few, I can usually go to sleep. So he goes to sleep. And then when he wakes up in the morning, that's when he, the girl tells, you know, that that's when he sees all the stuff on the CCTV footage of his friends who stayed up smashing the girl by the pool. He then confronts the girl. She said she had fun. She said it was consensual and blah, blah, blah. And he puts it up online and then she obviously disputes it and they go back and forth. To a guy that's had experience or to a guy that's just well adjusted, you would never invite somebody, you would never let someone stay at your house while you're sleeping, unless you're sleeping in the same bed. You know, we'll just let them, leave them alone with your friends. You'd put them in an Uber and say, okay, cool, I'm really sorry, this couldn't work out or whatever. You say your fucking goodbyes and you let them go. Or you'd make sure they all go out together, but you wouldn't leave the girl alone with your friends because you know what men are like. You know what your friends are like. You know what are gone. They all had a bit of drink. Like, why would you do that? Unless you stay up with them, they all go or she goes definitely by herself. So the moment he let her stay at his house, he opened himself up to trouble because imagine if they did rape her then you're still kind of responsible he doesn't realize that though he doesn't realize that he's kind of responsible for what goes on underneath his house underneath his roof so if you left her alone you didn't look after her correctly you you didn't do the gentle you didn't do the gentlemanly thing of putting her in a room and sending her home you didn't do the gentlemanly thing of making sure she's okay you left her alone with these wolves these animals under your roof and then something happened so either something happens consensually, which is also a bummer because that's the girl that you invited to your house. If it doesn't happen consensually, you let this girl, you put this girl in danger because you were sleeping and you weren't really aware of your surroundings and shit. It's all fucking bullshit. So I wonder, and my hope actually going forward, maybe this will spurn the renaissance or like the change on social where we do a change and it becomes now a movement of gentlemen. Because I'd like to see that. Because I think I've had enough of seeing videos of Fresh and Fit or a video of these guys on these platforms where they invite all these OnlyFans girls on there just to kind of embarrass them and humiliate them on camera, make them seem dumb, you know, all this sort of malarkey. I've had enough of that because I feel like those guys and that kind of scene is why we have the situations we have there. We have all these, you know, inexperienced men get themselves in situations that are completely unavoidable because they think having money having clout is an answer to all things and there isn't such a thing as like i don't know decorum com you know whatever there isn't such a thing as like class gentlemanly whatever attitude behavior that should also be at the forefront and not just like what you drive and what fucking what you're wearing so i hope as a consequence and as a result of all of this shit regardless of what happens there is maybe a move to kind of change things and kind of you know preach the fucking gospel of having how to be a gentleman because it's needed because clearly there's 
these guys need some direction. That's why, you know, the Andrew, Andrew Tate's are so popular. That's why kids love fucking sneaker and shit. Clearly, there are men out there that need advice and need guidance of how to, like, you know, deal with women and shit, how to handle sex and all that malarkey. But I don't think those guys are the right people to teach them. And obviously, their uh, doctrine at the moment is definitely um, not the best because these guys keep getting themselves in these situations constantly. It seems to be something along those, whether it's rape, whether it's an assault thing, whether it's kind of, you know, getting someone pregnant and making them force him to get an abortion. They're always involved in some nonsense that is easily, in my opinion, avoidable. If you really know Wagwan, if you've got a bit of riz, if you know how to treat people, like, like just treat people in general, forget even women, just treat people well. You wouldn't be in these type of situations in the first place, but they are. And I'm curious to see how it plays out. Um, for an academic, it's pretty sad, again, like I said, because the situation he's in, how he put himself in this type of position voluntarily is fucking dumb. Um, he's risked his entire hard work and career and legacy off of this one situation that he could have avoided if he just would have had a bit more sense. But now, um, regardless of what happens, even if he is found guilty, the smart of that being on your name is probably going to be everlasting, especially with his bad reputation, especially how people think of him. It's going to be a bit of a hard one to kind of come back from, but I'm curious to see if he does. Who knows? He might do. Talking about coming back from stuff, I'm sure some of you guys have already seen this, but Diddy decided to pop up on social media and officially apologize for the video that's gone, of course, somewhat viral online where he assaults Cassie on camera. And this was in 2016. They were in some hotel somewhere and Diddy ran out in a full towel, or well, half naked, basically only towel covering him and went in to, and basically kicked um, and punched um, Cassie while she was on the floor and then, and then actually threw a vase at her head while she was lying down also, right? Some really, really disturbing things you see on video. You're like, bloody hell, mate. This is absolutely brutal. This is a lot to deal with and to see in real time. But it definitely... Um, put a lot of kind of truth and validity to the earlier claims that were put out there and definitely um, was counter to his narrative that people were just out there to get money and to kind of you know get a name from him so they decided to jump on social media and try and clear his name or try to like stem the tide of negativity coming against him and um, the apology was uh, was a little bit unhinged I'm not gonna lie a little bit unhinged let me play the apology for you right now it's so difficult to reflect on the darkest times in your life, sometimes you gotta do that. I was fucked up. I mean, I hit rock bottom, but I made no excuses. My behavior on that video is inexcusable. I take full responsibility for my actions in that video. I'm disgusted. <laughs> I was disgusted then when I did it, I'm disgusted now. I went and I sought out professional help. <laughs> I had to go into therapy, <laughs> go into rehab. I had to ask God for his mercy and grace. I'm so sorry. But I'm committed to be a better man each and every day. I'm not asking for forgiveness. Truly sorry. So obviously you can tell, you know, all the beats that you need, right? When you're when you're the gaslighting, manipulating king, you need all the beats about being in a dark place, about the rehab thing, um, seeking forgiveness in a way, almost religious in the, in kind of explanation. But in general, the thing that kind of stuck out to me was like the lack of sincerity is just palpable. It almost reminds me of that Travis Scott video. Remember when Travis Scott um, first came on social media after the whole Astro World tragedy, where unfortunately those ten concert goers passed away at Astro World, and he tried to like do the fake like cry like hurt thing online, like on camera, where he was trying his best to try and force an emotion of sadness or something, where you know deep down he really didn't give a fuck because we all saw the videos, we saw how he was acting when people were fainting and being crushed in the crowd. He was almost annoyed that the show had to stop. He didn't really give a fuck. So this definitely reminds me a little bit of that Travis Scott video. But it's also, this is way more, um, this this also lacks a lot of sincerity because if you remember correctly, when the original lawsuit was put out and did he settled in record time in under 24 hours, he put out a statement that said, people are out there trying to basically lie on me for a quick buck 
the things that you hear about me aren't true. So essentially saying, hey, these allegations, this lawsuit aren't true. The fact that I settled isn't a rep isn't an, isn't basically an admission of guilt. I'm gonna clear my name. But the video describes exactly what we what we read in that lawsuit. The video was a, a direct description, a direct visual representation of what Cassie wrote in that lawsuit. So now everyone with a brain, myself included, sees that lawsuit and thinks, oh, everything else in that lawsuit was definitely true then. The rape allegations, all the other stuff that happened in there was definitely true. And, it, and even if, if anything as well, for people that were, because I think a lot more, a lot of people, myself, were already believed the lawsuit. The lawsuit was too extensive, was too well done. Or sorry, it was too detailed came from somebody that was a trusted person by the side of Diddy for a long time which was of course Cassie it was resolved in under 24 hours for me it was already a wrap that lawsuit everything was written and it was to me true but there were some people that doubted it there were some people that even doubted a little further the little Rod lawsuit because the details were too salacious about the pink cocaine the young Miami thing I should be get all this sort of stuff right everyone was probably a little bit too like oh my god this is obviously not true but now because we've seen this one video of Diddy beating Cassie in that hotel in 2016, it now makes all those other allegations way more valid. They now become way more believable. That's the issue that he has. Because he lied, obviously, we know the fact that he lied, and we've got the video. But that entire video has essentially, um, in a way, authenticated or brought a lot more truth to those other allegations from Little World and obviously the other ones from Cassie in the original lawsuit itself. So he doesn't really have a leg to stand on. No one believes him. And he's only saying sorry now because the video came out. Because maybe things could have been different, public perception-wise. When the lawsuit came out, he said this. But I don't think he could have said this anyway when the lawsuit came out because, you know, you probably, you probably would be advised against it from your um, representatives. But the fact that he's saying this now once the video is out, you know, fuck you, Jamie, you're done, basically, it's over, um, but I'm curious to see what actually does happen to him going forward, because he's in one of those rare positions where, unlike, like, Harvey Weinstein, it seems like, he's not going to get criminally charged for anything, because I think the LAPD put out a statement where they said that it happened too long ago, so they can't really charge him for that assault anyway, which is probably the reason why Cassie went to civil route in the first place, um, to get something from it especially money reputational damage from him obviously is going to be advantageous but i'm curious to see what actually happens to someone like him where you can't get done trick you can't get tried criminally your reputation's in tatters but now you're gonna to have to pay a ton of money civilly because i'd imagine off the back of that video a ton of other people will probably come out now and feel brave about coming out um and it will obviously lend more credence to the other lawsuits you put out there you might want him to go away so you try and settle out court so will it get to a point where he just runs out of money um, and what does that look like? Will he get to a point where he tries to rehabilitate his... Because I, I can see an angle, and again, this is a really mad thing to see, but I can see a scenario where Diddy tries to do like the black anti-council culture grift. Because in white circles, when you get cancelled, the thing you do is that you lean right, you go conservative. In the black space, I feel like if you get cancelled for something, especially if it's like a sexual thing, especially if it's a sexual violence thing, you go down the Christian route. You go down there, so maybe he starts to, you know, he goes, he gets baptized, he changes his name, he becomes a pastor. I can see that route being a thing because if one thing about the black community, they we love to forgive people that sh don't need our forgiveness, right? Everybody loves to fucking offer their hand of forgiveness, whatever, you know, use religion as a crux for awful, evil shit. So I can definitely see a scenario where he, Diddy becomes Pastor Diddy and then that's how he tries to rehabilitate his image and then he gets his family on fucking stage and all this shit. And he might call himself Pastor Abraham. I don't know. He gets a new name. That's definitely the way to kind of go about it. Because there's no other way. Well, no other thing he can do. He can't He can't do the whole... He tried it in this apology to do the whole mental health thing. Like, oh, I was in a dark place. It's like, shut up. Like, <laughs> like, no one believes you. So I'm sure he's going to try and do some angle to try and make it work for him and try and spin it in another way. But... What a crazy, crazy timeline to kind of live in real time. Um, to see this stuff kind of play out in public has been kind of wild. And it's also been kind of wild to see all the people that were like saying that it wasn't believable because, you know, there were some people out there, especially men, who were basically saying that Cassie was doing it for a check and she wasn't really, you know, why didn't she speak early? That was the main defense. Why didn't she speak early? Why didn't she speak early? Which is a really insane thing to say when 
most of us know even if you're not even if you haven't been involved in situations where someone's been violent but just from observation so you know just from anecdotal experiences you'll know that people in abusive relationships don't leave normally until like what is it i think the average is like seven times right seven attempts it takes them for them to actually leave and seven attempts is no there's no you know it depends on how long that could be over a year over several years but it takes seven attempts to officially leave a crucial relationship which is made even harder when the person is somebody noteworthy um somebody who's influential somebody as powerful as diddy so the fact that cassie took that long to kind of come out with the story isn't surprising to me in the slightest it really isn't um but some people were surprised by it and where they were sort of like saying oh because she didn't come out sooner it's not true well now we know it's true and now these people are fucking quiet they haven't said a single word online which again is pretty disgusting in itself like if you're gonna if you're gonna defend him loudly when this stuff comes out you should also be retracting your words loudly also but again you don't probably probably don't need him to say sorry who gives a fuck but it's just funny to see those people but i think a lot of those people anyway in general i'm not gonna lie i think a lot of those people there is a group of people out there who do this like i've noticed when somebody noteworthy gets cancelled they try and like slip in there and be their friend it's i guess it's a clever tactic because diddy's rich like he's very very rich there's a scenario or there's a possibility that regardless of what happens he's not going to run out of money and he's probably looking for friends because everyone's abandoned him because he's bad news right and he's a uh, he's got this cloud hanging over his head so if you're clever and you actually do want to play the whole like clout game you kind of want to lick ass you kind of want to curry favor maybe now's the ab opportune time to slip in and try and be his friend because he's going to remember this because everyone's abandoned him right everyone's abandoned him the people that he helped the people that he got started the people that he lent money to the people that he co-signed they've all abandoned him c correctly so so if you decide to come in now and try and be Diddy's friend, you might end up getting written into the will. You might end up getting a few grands. It's going to be advantageous to you. And there's no good, better example of it. There's no better example of it than Dr. Umar Johnson. He popped up on his flipping socials and look what he's saying, right? Look what he's saying. You can tell he's angling to kind of become Diddy's fucking spiritual, um, I don't know, societal advisor or something, right? Dr. Umar Johnson says on his social media account, I'm not going to give this much too I'm not going to give this too much energy as we have far more important issues to address than what happened 10 years ago. So obviously dismissing and diminishing what happened to Cassie because I don't know we have other issues to deal with as a culture which is mad when people say this sort of stuff because it's almost as if you can't do two things at the same time. You can't, you know, you can't fight several causes at the same time. You have to only focus on one. I guess so, whatever. Um however, this isn't the end of this isn't the end of Diddy. T.D. Jakes will help set him up his own mega church. He will be saved and baptized and will probably make more money as a pul pulpit pimp than he ever was as a mogul. Puffy will rise from the ashes, hashtag born again. Now, I'm not too sure if he's being insulting, if he's trying to be Diddy's friend, but still, it sounds like he's trying to make it all about himself, which again, is a grifter's 101 right while this tragedy like you never let a bad tragedy pass you by like you're always trying to insert yourself in a thing to kind of make some sort of relevancy so here's dr umar johnson saying this sort of thing and then the second one was really an interesting one i thought as well was really interesting which again is you know just in, an insane and in like imagine your brain working like this right dr umar johnson put this as well on i think this is my own instagram i also wonder this if cassie was a dark-skinned black woman would did he be getting his backlash Y'all don't go this hard when dark-skinned black women are done bad every day. We need to make sure that any man who does this to women held accountable. But as for me, it's especially African and black women. There were stories of him breaking Kim Porter's nose, but since it didn't make national news, ain't nobody caused no fuss. But off that, the gops that killed Breen and Taylor, we let off the gas. The cops that killed Sandra Bland, we let off the gas. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Already in this argument, he's kind of contradicting himself because he says no one would care if Cassie was dark skinned, which is an insane thing to say. No one would care about some woman being who was the very public and, you know, uh, girlfriend of a very famous man for a long time comes out and reports abuse that we all didn't know about. No one would care if she was dark or white. Or, that doesn't make any sense. But anyway, let's let's say he's right, what he said there. He then contradicts it 
by mentioning Kim Porters, who was a fairly light skinned woman, who was, you know, the mother of a, of a few of Diddy's kids and shit. So no one cares about Cassie if she wasn't dark. No one cares if she wasn't. But then you mentioned Kim Porters. What? Everyone cared about her when she was around, but she didn't come forward. She didn't say nothing. So if you had to kind of just go off the scraps of evidence or stories that we had out there, it's because Cassie came forward. That's why people care the most. And because there was a lawsuit, lots of details. Now we have a video. That's why people care more and they're way more invested in it. And obviously she's still out here, current, blah, 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 blah. So this whole narrative is fucking wild. But I wonder if this is a really clever and opportune thing to do to insert yourself in Diddy's life or just a clever thing to do to make it all about you. Because... Maybe he's kind of annoyed if you're Dr. Umar Johnson that you can't really sell your grift now while this is happening. So you kind of insert yourself here by, you know, trying to make yourself, in one way, you're trying to like make yourself the darling of black women online, especially on social media. They kind of dictate a lot of the, the, the conversation that goes on, especially when it comes to relationships and all that malarkey. So you're trying to cover your favor with them while also trying to appear to be the civil rights leader that you think you are an activist. But just this, this isn't the time. Read the room, you know? We don't need to hear from Dr. Umar Johnson regarding this situation right now. And this obviously isn't an issue about black, white. If anything, this whole Diddy thing is more of an issue about power and about influence and about wealth and all this sort of shit because he was able to silence a lot of people and keep things under wraps because of his name and because of who he was. Um, and now, obviously, things have kind of gone downhill. Everyone's now just suddenly decided to be brave and step out and say something. But this isn't really like a racial thing, I don't think, personally. But if you're Dr. Umar Johnson, the racial grift is what you do. So you have to keep on pushing that until the wheels fucking fall off. But I thought that was pretty disgusting from him. But again, shouldn't be surprised when it comes to Dr. Umar Johnson. He is a pretty despicable and disgusting person anyway. Okay, moving on to the last story of today, which is this pretty sad one from an account on social media that I'm not really too sure what their name... Okay, the name on social media is li one 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 li and it features a story regarding one half of Afterlife called Carmine Emrat Conti. As you guys know, Afterlife are a very famous um, de um, tech house, deep house DJ duo. Um, you would know them from their very famous and well-known logo of the person kind of, you know, jumping down into a pool upside down, right? That kind of cross sign, really cool type of logo. Um, they've become extremely popular over the last five or ten, ten years. Um, they've come, you know, some of the biggest festivals, doing some of the biggest parties. Um, I think I saw them play at Junction one year. Um, again, really popular DJs. I'm sure some of you knows who they are. Somebody is alleging um, some very dicey things about them and they put it in this really, really, really wild um, Instagram story that I'm going to read out here for you to check out what it happened. So let's read through the whole thing and see what I'll go on. So this um, is courtesy again of the account li.41s.li uh, and the story goes as follows. Mark, sorry, Carmine Emrak Conti. Did you forget how you drugged and violated a woman? Did you forget how you touched somebody without their consent? I am not the first woman to live this hell, but I wish I were the last. The pain I felt when I woke up, oh, bleeding between my legs as I walked was unbearable. Yo, that's a detail, isn't it? Did you forget how you asked for forgiveness when I sent you a doctor's evaluation and prescriptions? Today, I chose not to remain silent and to relive my burden onto you. I have all the evidence of my rape, real-time locations, photos of this entire work team, the prescriptions from the doctor I went to, who is a witness to my sexual abuse. There are also photos from the hotel where we all stayed. Today, everyone will know what a sexual abuser you are. So this woman is alleging that one half of Afterlife violently raped her, I'm assuming, at, after some event somewhere. Again, another... Another, another fucking, you know, another situation of a well-known DJ violating somebody. It's like, I don't know. I've always wondered why this is is such a thing. I guess maybe because it's nightlife and because there's drugs and drinks involved, maybe lines get blurred. But I don't think that's an accurate. I don't think that's an appropriate or I don't think that's um that's enough of an excuse. Because in my opinion, I, I would imagine, again, I don't know much and I'm not really involved as much as I probably would want to be, but I'd imagine at some level, 
when you're a DJ, especially at this level, you probably get pussy thrown at you, like, or literally given to you in an envelope. It gives you an envelope, easy to open, has one of those tear things open, like, just take me, you know? If that's the case, why do you need to do this? You know? That's the thing I'm wondering. There's a certain level of DJ once you get to some level, and we've seen it with some of the male groupies, right? There's probably men out there who are straight who would probably suck your dick if you ask them. If that meant you'd give them a fucking tune ID for a fucking or whatever or a set list, you know, of the or, of the songs you played or just your USB, right? There'll probably there's probably straight dudes out there that would suck guys D to suck guys' dicks if they were able to get a fucking USB from their fucking favorite DJ. So if that's the case, why do these guys do these things? Is it because they were always like this even before the fame? Did the fame corrupt them and make them think they were untouchable so they can feel they can get away with everything? Or is this a consequence of all things in, included? Is this one of those things where it's like, it's nightlife, drugs and drinks are involved, only spooky things happen after 9 p.m., people don't have control of their inhibitions or themselves, and sometimes fucked up shit happens. I don't know. But either way, this seems to be a common occurrence, a common occurrence, especially with the bigger... The, the, and this isn't not some... It's, it would be one thing if these were like local scene people, but the biggest guys and girls out there who, like I said before, could probably get pussy FedEx to them, to their fucking hotel door. They probably have a queue going down the fucking hallway, down the fucking stairs, out of the fucking building if they wanted to. They always end up in these situations. Why is it? What the fuck is going on? This is so wild. Today, everyone would know what sexual abuser you are. To put a little bit of into context about how I met them, I had some doubts about the party that Afterlife was playing. I wanted to know the real meaning of the visuals they were playing, the meaning of the underlying messages that was not that was my only intention. Okay, so they're saying I only went there to research, to have a good time, find out what the inspiration of the logo is, because I'm sure some of you have, haven't seen it. The logo, the Afterlife. Let's do Afterlife Rave. Um, I think it's a really cool logo personally I've always personally liked it I think they also put it really cool on fucking um, hats and shit but that upside down kind of suicide logo thing is fucking cool I've always loved that I'm not gonna lie I've always thought it looks pretty cool and I guess nowadays because they're really huge they do all these kind of like really cool augmented reality type of um, events as well where they have these really cool visuals on screens but these are basically the Afterlife DJs so the person that she's talking about or this person's talking about, I think it's a she, is this guy there. That's MRAC. That's one half of the DJ duo. So MRAC is the person that she's talking about, who happens to also be number one. This is the funny thing as well. If you know about Afterlife, you'll know that he happens to be the one that looks the most fucked. Whenever they're DJing, he's always the one that's sweating the most. Maybe he's taking the most bumps. He's had the most lines. He's the one that looks like he's been drinking the most. Whereas this one, I forgot he's one. Of, I think I forgot his name. I think it might be Angelo. But the other guy who's um, involved in the afterlife, he's the one that's usually focused. He's the one that usually got the hat on. He's staring right at the mixer. He's chew he's doing the thing. He's playing. He's not really fucking around. But this is the guy that's always like having a good time. So maybe that is, uh, you know, maybe that kind of explains some of the reason why we're currently here. Anyway, it continues. So I was contacting them for a while through an Instagram until the day of February 26, 2023. So this happened last year. They played in a party in CDMX, which is um, Mexico, that where, where I met the tale of us. They were staying at Four Seasons Hotel and I happened to be in CDMX. So we met to, for dinner and then went to party. That was the day I met them without knowing what I was getting into. So they met them again. Probably this is a bit contradictory to me to say this or a bit hypocritical of me to say this but this is why probably you shouldn't meet djs isn't it <laughs> in general you just shouldn't meet them like you just shouldn't meet them unless you meet them at the party or something with a group of friends or whatever you should meet anybody anywhere that you don't know especially off the strength of instagram like oh, i was gonna meet you like some random stranger it probably isn't the best thing to do probably especially if you're on your own especially if you're a woman as well like it's just too risky um, it continues. I would be a few days in Argentina from April the 4th to the 8th in 2023, and I was invited for those days. On April the 7th, ending the party at Carmine Animal, Carmine Mark's Afterlife Animal, because I can't find any other way to call that person. He drugged me and sexually abused me. I had lost consciousness and I didn't even drink alcohol or take any drug. I woke up and I was torn up. I had blood running down my legs. I asked him what happened and he told me of what. And I showed him the blood and he said, oh, that you wanted more. You asked for it. <sighs> Yo. When people start describing stuff like this to this level of detail. Yo, 
I don't know, man. I'm, I'm fucking prone to believe it because that's a lot of that's a lot of detail there, of exactly where they were, the dates. Saying clearly, I wasn't, I didn't drink, I didn't take any drugs, which will probably could be. Ah, uh, I guess it's too late now. It's a year after, but you could probably prove that with a fucking toxicology report if needed. Whew. Without remembering anything, I just thought and said, I can't believe this cynicism of this monster. I told him that I wanted to go back to Mexico because I couldn't stand the pain. And he only asked me for forgiveness. This bit I don't understand. So this person allegedly raped you violently and you're asking him to go, well, you're asking him to pay for you to go back to Mexico. You, well, you just want to run away. Well, why are you talking to him in the first place? You know, call the police, no? Hmm. It continues. I couldn't even rest on the plane. I was crying and or maybe they don't mean maybe they don't mean they asked to go back they asked them permission maybe they're just saying i was speaking to them i don't know this seems like a weird sentence i told him that i wanted to go back to mexico why are you telling him you want to go back to mexico why don't you just go back if that happened you just run away as soon as possible call the police or you know call your brother to go and fucking hit them over the head with a baseball bat or something Do you know what i mean you don't talk to them Anyway, I couldn't even rest on the plane. I was crying and didn't understand why this happened to me. When I arrived in Guadalajara, oh, Guadalajara, that's where Brett and Shaw's wife's from, not. I had to go to the emergency room where they told me that I had to sue the person who had done this to me and that I was not alone. So the hospital can confirm, I guess this is another, she could, again, this person has a lot of evidence, to be fair, if there needs to be verified, because I'm sure the hospital has record of her going to the emergency room. They'll have evidence of the injuries that she had uh, and maybe the person that was there could probably be a witness too. So there's a lot of people here that can corroborate or not this story. What I experienced, I couldn't wish for anyone else. Returning to the topic of when I met them in CDMX and the doubts I had after the party in CDMX, I asked Carmine Emrak about the doubts about afterlife. Okay, I asked him if it was about transhumanism, transhumanism and he just opened his eyes and looked at me and said, transhumanism? What do you know about that? Of course, it's all about transhumanism. That's the next step in human human evolution. What the fuck is transhumanism? Transhumanism. Meaning. Transhumanism is the position that human beings should be permitted to use technology to modify and enhance human cognition and bodily function, expanding abilities, uh, capacities beyond current biological constraints. This sounds like high talk to me, isn't it? Why are you discussing this? This sounds like stuff that you talk about and afters after you've kind of racked up a few lines or shit. But again, what do I know? For those who don't know what this is, it's about improving humanity through technology by questioning humanity's own limits, such as life extension. That's what they make you believe, that you can change, dominate, and override natural events such as old age, guilt, suffering, and even death. That's a funny thing, though, to, as a topic, though, that DJs are this, DJs are talking about this shit makes sense because you're living head in this. You're living a lavish, expense paid, very profitable um, life as a DJ. So you probably want the party to never stop. That's what you want. You don't want it to ever stop because it's nonstop. Every weekend you're getting booked. Every place you're flying from place to place. You're at amazing location. You're meeting all the great people. Everyone's got a smile on their face. Everyone's happy to see you. You're drinking for free. You're taking drugs for free. You're making loads of money. You're wearing cool clothes. You're wearing cool black t-shirts. Like it's fucking amazing. So maybe this is a a real. This is a. This makes sense to talk about as a DJ because you know. Hey, I want this party to never stop. They believe that they can bypass a human body by transferring all information contained in each individual into a computer. That's why their visuals depict wires connecting to human robots, carrying humans on their legs and humans passing whereas a robot opens its face and the smoke coming out of the human and being passed to the robot. That is not something that is far from reality. There are already, hold on, you got, you got raped allegedly by this guy violently and you're giving us an essay on transhumanism. This person is not, you know, why well, one? Are they a bit tapped? Like, why are you giving us an essay on this shit? Like, write a Substack. Why are you telling us this? There are already people who call themselves cyborgs, and you can find videos and documentaries about them where they have already implemented chips in their bodies to control things in their environment. 
Here comes the worst part. This can cause inequalities between um, countries and continents, increasing the digital divide and the possibility of social conflicts. On the other hand, the debate often rises regarding moral, judicial, and ethical flaws and generating social confusion. Yo, did, 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 is she trying to lead up to the point of her getting raped by Neuralink or something? Like, why do we need to know this shit? Organ cloning nanotechnology prosthetic implants with ai in some cases seem to be beneficial for humans but surprise they also have their disadvantages first and foremost this is more than enough to worry me man may lose his entire human identity so she went to meet afterlife to discuss transhumanism and the meaning behind their logo then she got freaked out when the main guy says yes i believe in transhumanism I guess. Is that what she's trying to say? Is that, I don't see the point of this fucking essay. One day, I noticed a tattoo of a cross on his hand. Isn't that the most obvious tattoo he has? I swear that Emrak guy, doesn't he have that tattoo of a cross right on the palm of his hand? Oh my god, oh my bugging. How did, you, how did you just notice that? It's right there, yeah, it's right on his hand. It's like a quintessential like Italian guy tattoo, right? He's got that tattoo, like either, he, he's got that tattoo on the same hand or thumb where you'd have like a thumb ring classic italian guy tattoo cool all right um so i asked him do you believe in jesus he replied of course he doesn't believe in jesus he fucking raped you allegedly <laughs> asking your rapist if they believe in jesus is fucking insane no that was before when i was young now i like the devil i like the devil better he then asked do you like the little devil Immediately, he showed me tattoos on both arms depicting demons and horns. He told me that those little devils had already given him everything he wanted. Fame, money, power. I shared with him that since I was little, I had beings that tormented me during my bad... Oh, this woman is like... She's going through it, isn't it? I had demons that were tormenting me and my bad episodes. He said that this was a gift and that I should learn to dominate them. To dominate it. He constantly repeated to me the word incubus. For those who don't know, this term means to lie down, to spawn a demon. So what, he wanted to plow a demon in you or something by busting inside of you. He was going to give you a little Lucifer. Fuck, what is this story? I don't know if this is all... Inside a woman, the victims experience this as a dream without being able to wake up. <sighs> Yo, DJ fans are like, this is intense, man. Now I understand why DJs are like a little bit cunty to their fans. Because this is meant to be a fan who got in touch with them to find out about transhumanism and the meaning of their logo. And now we're getting to like Satanism and spirits and possession. Like what the fuck is going on here? That's why sometimes when a DJ airs you, when you ask them for a tune ID, don't take it, don't take it personally because they probably got 17 of these messages from some freak giving them fucking 17 fucking pages of fucking DMs. Like what the fuck is this? This being can also take the form of a handsome man. Hey, handsome black man. Sometimes even making... Check out my son card. Hello. Uh, sometimes even <laughs> making his victims fall in love. While all this is happening, it consumes the energy of the seduced woman. When it is Incubus who intends to expend the life of his lover, she enjoys health and physical and emotional well-being in Incubus and in love and can be beneficial as dangerous. Well, I already had some understanding of these intentions, so I became more alert. Little by little, they started to introduce me to people from their circle. Managers, producers, backing singers, musicians, even audio engineers, bringing me closer and closer to them. Or, is you, or are you just out with them and they're introducing you to the team? One day, Carmine said to me, I want to see what's in your mind. He asked me to tell me some words and he would input them into the artificial intelligence software. What? Chat GPT? I started to describe to him a road, a sun, lines, a sky. Emrak responded, saying that it was basic and it looked that I was creating. That it was literally the doors to the underworld and started to laugh. He told me that the people here are crazy, pointing out the words that they were discussing like Armageddon, demon, darkness, evil, death, etc. I just observed that being in my intention, I just observed that, so I just observed that had been my intention from the beginning. Little by little, I discovered more things that disgusted me, not only about them, but everything that they did, their work, their team, their intentions behind everything, how they had made fun of other artists with their parties. They are not good people. 
I imagine many remember one of these first visuals in Afterlife at Tulum, depicting a guy opening a sea with a staff. That's the part of the Bible where Moses stretches his arm out over the sea for everyone to walk. Exodus 14, 21 to 22. She's even giving us Bible scriptures. Yo. All these things are against religion. And well, I'm also very much against fant fantasism. I may not be the most devout, but I believe in repentance and I have faith in God. You have faith in God, so you DM random DJs and go link them in fucking Mexico. Huh? What? I also recalled something about their visuals that reminded me of the verse from the Bible. As you saw, iron mixed with clay, they will mix one with another, but they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. Daniel 2.43 We are the clay. Hence, the visuals of the trees being floated and the metal and the giant gates. Is she trying to get a job with them in a way? Is she trying to get a job as like their fucking copywriter? <laughs> does she want to write the blurb on, on an RA event? <laughs> representing the portals everything has been a meaning imagine writing this much shit about someone that allegedly raped you like what i understand it all i knew that their message was their objective and the evil rituals of their puppets it's like cassie writing the fucking soliloquy about the origins of bad boy bad boy they're too big like what like their afterlife logo represents an upside down cross have you seen the actors strikes in hollywood oh my god bro oh my god i feel this person because i think this is how my brain works right this is like adhd brain i, I kind of feel them where they're going on these different tangents but we first started off with an account of rape and now we're talking about the actor strike in hollywood <laughs> okay let's go have you seen the actor strikes in hollywood it's amazing how this is affecting everyone. If you're a musician reading this, you should consider questioning who you're supporting, what you want to do with your project, and who you can make a change because you could be the replace in a matter of minutes. When I discovered this, I felt disgusted inside. All these parties I attended years ago in Tulum in some parts of Mexico, believing that everyone was good vibes, ecstatic, happy together with their friends and my family, without knowing what we were dancing to and what we were contributing to. Now I feel sorry for all those people I see giving their energy and souls at these satanic parties. They think that their everything is light and love and peace, but they don't have the slightest idea that these puppets represent. How sad to see all these artists wanting to be a part of this label. I appeal for support from the music industry, from all the women who experience something similar, from all the people who support the women's movement. Share so that everyone knows the truth about these people and what they lied did to me. How they manipulate and use their parties as rituals. If I don't raise my voice, it could be another woman who ends up suffering like I did. I guess that's a picture of them going to some place. I don't know where that place is. There's a image of the of the of the medication they got. The medication is called Sulacion. Uh, I don't know. It, no, that's not the name. What's the, what's the name of the medicine? I don't know. I don't give a fuck to be completely honest. But I guess that's, there, there's something there that's bad. Um, continuing on, there's a clip of them behind the scenes hanging out with Emrak, I think, preparing for their set. So it's just that person with them with Afterlife, actually. Cool. So cool. And there's something else here. See photo. We have a. This is from WhatsApp. I think we have a conversation here with Emrak. Hola, buena día. ¿Cómo estás? Me dice a Carmen se pone se visto sus amigos en la está en back porque traen unos regalos para nosotros. Ja ja ja, claro. Para qué días? Para todos. Para pa. Who gives a fuck? Right, cool. Okay. Um, what are the comments saying here? Men, please start protecting us better. We don't need handouts. We are asking for anything. Um, thank you for sharing your story. The women out here, victim blaming, justifying. I have. I have a, been a huge Afterlife fan, but no doubt the shows and videos have felt so different. The theme of transhuman. <sighs> anyway, I don't know what the fuck's going on here. I don't know if this is real or not. Maybe the if even if this person does have some sort of like mental health issues, this definitely doesn't take away from the allegations. But it does make it hard to kind of follow because there's a lot of information here. There's a lot to get through. It kind of gives me a bit of a headache. I'm not gonna lie. But the detail this person went into most likely what they're saying is likely going to be true well if that's the case i guess we we'll have to wait and see how it kind of plays out um but judging by some of the comments on here um a lot of people are saying that the same thing i've been warning people not to around me not to go to any afterlife parties and other DJs i know that work with negative entities i've seen them doing stuff those people are satanic 
So I guess there's something about Afterlife that people don't like, the satanic imagery and shit, maybe. I guess that's something people are kind of talking about, but I don't really know. I don't really pay too much attention closely to them. Um, but yeah, who knows what's going on? Either way, like I said, I just find it funny how all these interesting and odd, how all these big DJs seem to be involved in this sort of shit where it involves like rape and sexual assault and stuff, especially when they're at a position where they can legitimately get anything they want from any person that they want um, due to their celebrity and status, but they still want to get it by force. I guess that's a kink. Maybe that's just them being evil or just monsters in general. Either way, um, watch your P's and Q's. And it definitely does need to be a little bit more of a of a of a of a message put out there to people not to kind of hit people up especially if you're a woman and to try and meet them up like i, I, I just don't think it's you're offering yourself up to somebody in a very it's a it's, i think it's just it's a bizarre interaction especially if you're a girl maybe different if you're a dude but if you're a girl it's just it just it's almost like a fly out culture when someone flies you out yes it's a bit monstrous and a bit um presumptuous for them to expect sex but if they did fly you out and pay that ticket it does make sense why they're expecting that because why would you then go if you're not willing to do that sort of shit same thing when it comes to dming a dj to hang out it's like especially if you're a girl and there's two dudes it's like watch your piece at least go with your friend you know what i mean even if you don't do something at least go with somebody that you kind of you know you trust and shit just to kind of have your back but just going there blindly is kind of wild i'm not gonna lie um but obviously that's no excuse if this is true for what happened but Jesus Christ, what a trip to get through. What a fucking trip. Um, hopefully they get the support they need. Hopefully that gets kind of dealt with. Interesting. It'll be interesting to see how this kind of gets covered because Afterlife, you know, they're big. They're on a huge label. They're very well-known DJs. Most publications might want to run a mile away from it to not cover the story because of the links certain labels have with certain festivals, certain publications, all this really horrible, nasty stuff that will make you want to lose faith in the scene but let's see how it transpires how it plays out but it's not looking good for mrac from afterlife it's not looking good from mrac from afterlife oh and that's a, i guess that's the person as well that's that's them here i guess that's the young lady that posted the the clips as you can see here that's them obviously featured on their fucking socials and shit so yeah i guess more uh more power and strength to this young lady hopefully she gets it sorted hopefully she gets it sorted Anyway, that has been the Exxon Zinger Show, episode number 779. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure. It hasn't been a chore. Um, if you've enjoyed the show and you liked what you've seen, you've seen what you like, you know what to do. Give me a flipping like down below if you're watching the live stream. If you're, of course, checking this out after, after the fact or on the audio side of things, make sure you leave me a five-star review on all the nice platforms that have five-star reviews. That would be so, 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 so appreciated if you could do that. Um, for those of you tuning live and watching the stream and hanging out with me, I'm going to play for you guys my tune of the day because, hey, why the hell not? Let's play a bit of a tune of the day for those of you hanging out with me. And the tune of the day today will be courtesy of the one and only Remy Wolf, her new single called Toro. Remy Wolf Toro will be my tune of the day playing for those of you who are watching the stream live and after the fact for the ones who are watching the stream live I will be doing the random show in about an hour so if you want to listen to the random show updates on Brendan and all that malarkey tune in about an hour we'll do the random show as well but this is my tune of the day it is Toro courtesy of Remy Wolf playing for you right now thank you for checking out thank you for checking me out